All right, so again, welcome. My name is Andy Marchant. I am director of NVC8. Happy to have all of you here tonight for an exciting spotlight on entrepreneurship here at CU Boulder. So we do have a very busy night ahead of us. Just want to have a few opening remarks, then we'll jump in. And I have to share a memory of mine thinking back to seven months ago here in this very room, early September. We were kicking off the NVC season. We had Lisa Reeves with Workday here sharing her entrepreneurial journey. We had Philip Tayton, who is an NVC past co-champion, in here sharing his thoughts. He was wearing his Brad is Rad hat for Brad Bernthal, and he was telling all of the NVC teams to use and abuse the NVC director as much as possible. By the way, the director is me, um, but I'm happy to report that they did that. They took his uh, advice. Seven months later, they thoroughly used and abused me, but that's rightfully so, because that meant they were accessing resources that the NVC provides. That meant that they were progressing, and that's what the NVC is all about. I think back, uh, we, it, some crazy things happened. We had a team pitch in here in full-on spandex. That was pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> We had crazy mentor matching night. That's a mad dash of speed dating between the mentors and the teams. Over the last seven months, we've had teams founded. We've had ideas created. We've had ideas killed. And we've had pivots. And all of that leads up to tonight. Five finalist teams here to pitch to you and to the judges. And it's really all about a spotlight on entrepreneurship here at CU. It's going to be a very exciting night. Before I go any further, I do want to recognize some very special people in the room. So if we have any NVC sponsors or anybody who works for NVC sponsored teams, would you please stand up and stay standing? And I know you're out there. And, and stay standing for me if you could. Stay standing. I also want any NVC mentors in the room to also stand up. I've, I've got a favor to ask of everybody else in the room. Give these people hugs, shake their, shake their hand if that's your thing. But it's really about these sponsors and mentors. Without them, the NVC couldn't happen. Without them, the NVC wouldn't be special. So help me again thank them. So real quickly, I do want to go through an agenda for the night. You have it in your programs in more detail, but just some high-level points. We're going to have some welcome remarks, then we'll get into our first two pitches. After the first two pitches, we will have a short break. Feel free to grab refreshments next door in Betcher Hall. We'll also have some demo desks out front as well. But be back here at 640 because we've got three more pitches to get through. After that, the judges will step out to deliberate. We will stay here for the NVC Awards, always a fun part of the night. After the NVC Awards, the judges will come back out to make their announcements, and then we'll have a reception afterwards, more food and drink in Betcher Hall, and then, of course, the demo desks from some wonderful teams as well. So with that said, as I, as I mentioned, it's a tight ship we're running tonight. I'm going to jump straight into the evening. And to start us off, we're going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to start with the Women's Entrepreneurship Prize from Olivia Miller. She's a CU student here, so please help me welcome Olivia. How about the podium, be best? Oh, over here? Yeah, there you go, give me some mic. All right, can you hear me? Hello, my name is Olivia Miller, and I'm the Vice President of the CU MBA Women in Business Club here at CU. And our goal as a club is to promote women in all areas of business. So when a friend approached me last summer and said, you should create a women's entrepreneurship prize for the new venture challenge, I couldn't say no. And I did some research, and I found that women entrepreneurs, specifically, are underfunded, under-mentored, yet when these women do succeed as founders, they consistently earn higher returns for their investors. So, the Women's Entrepreneurship Prize aims to tackle some of these problems. This year we raised $10,000. Yeah. This would not have been possible without Marianne Rose, founder of Spend Difference, 
the CU Women's Council, and Zayo Group. So thank you. We had 13 teams apply in total, and our winner was Hive Tech Solutions. Hive Tech. <laughs> HiveTech aims to improve the health of bees through technology. Thank you. Hive. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Olivia. All right, next up to share some opening remarks for the night is Phil Weiser. Some of you may know him as Dean of the Law School, AKA Coach. Some of you may know him as Executive Director for Silicon Flatiron Center, AKA My Boss. All of you know him though as a champion of entrepreneurship here at CU. Please welcome Phil Weiser. I think it was at our startup summer kickoff last year that someone said, Oh yeah, he's dean of the law school, but what's really important is he supports entrepreneurship, which is pretty much how I view myself, because I'm only dean for three more months and I plan to be supporting entrepreneurship for a very long time. The strides we've taken as a university are pretty exceptional. It was about 10 years ago um, when uh, Brad Bernthal and I were having lunch and um, we uh, were talking with some friends in the business school. I think we had uh, Steve Lawrence with us maybe, uh, and Frank Moyes, if memory serves. And Frank said, I have a dream, which is getting the campus working all together as an entrepreneurial university. And the centerpiece of that would be a, he didn't use these words, but I'll call it this, a new venture challenge. Here we are, and this is number eight? Eight. eight. So, we have pulled together the campus in a way that crosses age, disciplinary, boundaries, um, ideas that have iterated in months, in years, and we're all in this together to support each other. And that collaborative, team-oriented approach is what makes Boulder special. For those who haven't read Fletcher Richmond's riff on this topic about Entrepreneur University, you need to. What's important to know, you all here get it, so you are hugely advanced in the world we live in. Being an entrepreneur is not a choice. It's a necessity for everyone. The only question is whether you know it or not. So among my most favorite people in the audience is Ron Sangren, who was an entrepreneur without using the label. He's now going to call himself a reluctant entrepreneur, which I'll take it. If you are in the public sector, you need to be an entrepreneur. When I had coffee across the street about a decade ago with Daniel Epstein and he described the Unreasonable Institute, I thought he was trying to sell sand in the desert. But he did it. He has built a national, international, powerhouse, formidable, accelerator, beyond words, entity helping social entrepreneurship in both for-profit and not-for-profit form. Having the ability to dream big, work together, support each other, can deliver great things. This campus is just getting started. There's a great team of people who you hear from tonight. Terry Fies, our new Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation. Um, Doug Smith, Sharon Matusik, Eric Mueller, Brad Bernthal, who needs no introduction to this group. Um, we also have now our first group of global entrepreneurs and residents with us here today, helping the New Venture Challenge. Um, we're just getting started, and this is going to make a huge impact on this campus, in this community, and can be a real model in the nation and the world, because there are a lot of places out there that are saying, what's happening in Boulder, what's happening in Colorado, how do you guys support each other so well? This evening tonight is an unbelievable proof point example and a great um, point for celebration. So thank you guys all for all you do. Um, we're thrilled to be a part of it. All right, thanks so much, Phil. Up next, I want to touch on two points, rules and then the prizes for the evening. Real quick on rules, teams have five minutes to pitch. They have a little box up here. It'll go yellow when you have one minute left. It'll go red when time is up. Kala is our time enforcer. She'll start clapping. I'll start clapping. The audience will start clapping. It's not you being rude. It's just us keeping on a strict time schedule. The teams are aware of it. They know the routine. 
After the pitch, they get five minutes of Q&A with the judges. We will not clap them off for that. We'll give them an extra second or two to finish up their answer or finish up the question that the judge wants to uh, shoot out to the teams. Real quick, you can see some of the qualities that the judges will be looking at. Um, suffice it to say tonight that we have five very high quality teams and it is going to be a tight race. Real quick on prizes, happy to report that this is a record breaking year for the NVC8 with prizes again. First place prize, the $10,000 cash Perkins Cooey prize. They also will be receiving one year of soft layer premium support and that's valued at over $120,000. So a very strong first prize this year. Second place, $3,000 minimum. Third place, $1,500 minimum. Let me just tell you this, basically the judges have $8,000 to split between second and third place. And then also for first and second place winners, they will be invited to an exclusive business think tank with Dan Caruso and other business leaders here in the front range. The runners up will receive $1,000 each. So every team will be leaving with a stack of cash tonight. It's just a matter of who will be leaving with what. With that said, I do want to turn it over to Brad Bernthal, Mr. Rad Brad Bernthal, to help us introduce the judges and the teams. Thanks. <laughs> I like that. We'll go back to the music here in a second. Uh, if anyone's waiting in the wings, please come on down, grab a seat. Uh, now's a good time to do it. This is a celebration of entrepreneurship at CU. People creating things that don't yet exist. This is one of my favorite nights of the year. It is my privilege to do three things. First, a special recognition. Second, introduce tonight's judges. And third, introduce tonight's teams. First, the recognition. Eight years ago, as Phil mentioned, a group of us at CU got together. We discussed a problem that the campus lacked a cross-campus platform for students, faculty, and staff who wanted to start a business. And we decided it'd be cool to collapse the campus. We decided it'd be cool to connect up the campus and the community, and we created the New Venture Challenge. Eight years ago, Amid an April storm, awful conditions, two feet of snow over in the UMC, we held those first championships. One of the judges that day was Nancy Pierce, an entrepreneur and an investor. Getting prize money for that first year of competition, something that didn't yet exist, was like squeezing blood from a turnip. No one wanted to get behind it. No one understood what we were trying to do. But Nancy saw it. She put in the seed money. She helped us get off the ground. Nancy has stayed involved. Eight years later, she continues to help mentor NVC teams. Many of you met Nancy last fall as she led a session at the mentor matching event. And eight years after launching the first NVC, it has become a force. The challenge here is how do we make this sustainable for the long term? And to that end, Nancy recently made a gift she is very modest about it, and I had to talk her into letting us highlight her contribution. Suffice to say that this gift meaningfully supports the New Venture Challenge, Silicon Flatirons, and entrepreneurship at CU. She does not want it to be a big deal, but I want to highlight how special it is to me to have someone who is with us at the start, who has stayed involved throughout to make a significant follow-on investment in entrepreneurship at CU Boulder. Please help me give a warm thank you to Nancy <laughs> Next, it is my pleasure to announce tonight's starting lineups. Our judges. Our first judge is a partner at Perkins Cooey in Denver and a qualified solicitor at, in England and Wales. A Swiss Army knife of a deal attorney. Kester can recap your company, take you through bankruptcy, do a section 363 <laughs> asset sale, then relax at home with some pro bono work. To get fit for tonight's event, this man trains for triathlons. Please help me welcome Kester Spinberg. <laughs> Our next judge was student body president at Fairview High School. <laughs> Chino's hoops. Her 
post game is so strong, Gino Ariema calls her the one that got away. <laughs> Gino's branding and culture was vice president of people, culture brand at Zayo Group. Now the head of talent acceleration with Tap Influence. She'll be putting up big points for tonight's <laughs> judging panel. Please help me welcome Rachel Donaldson. <laughs> Judge is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, investor, badass athlete, and most importantly, an alumna of CU Law. She co-founded Wild Oats and Sunflower Markets, is active in social entrepreneurship, which takes her to Baja, Mexico, and Guatemala. Her motto this evening, if this is not Class 5 Rapids Quality Company, it does not raise my pulse. Please help me welcome back Libby Cook. Finally, this judge brings the backbeat to tonight's championships panel. His man of mystery status was enhanced when the FBI looked into his software habits as a kid. He is a creative force behind the band Legitimate Front. He is a venture capitalist who literally wrote the book on deal terms, and he's now being recruited for Naked and Afraid. After surviving eight years of teaching with me in venture capital, please help me welcome Jason Mendelssohn. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, there are seven acknowledged wonders of the world. You are about to witness the eighth, if we're lucky, numbers eight through eight, 13. First, hailing from the IT track. These computer science-oriented visionaries are making better audio for our world. They have a platform where your favorite voice, talent, reads your favorite stuff to you. Yes. Your mom will be reading you again to bed soon with the best hair in tonight's competition. Please help me welcome Brian, Fahid, Freddie, and Pay out loud. He's so good at this. This company is ready to take your science experiment into orbit. Hailing from the social track, the R&D track, and a satellite near you. They create the Microtel for experiments in space, the android of aerospace. Please meet these world-class researchers who are taking CU research to another world. Christine and Luis, Space Research Company. <laughs> After our break, batting third, in best in show, Parker Posey could not find Busy B. It would not be a problem if they had this company's technology on their side, bringing hobbyists and commercial beef tenders into the 21st century. This company out of the general track. Please help me welcome Justin, Kimberly, Chelsea, and Peggy Hive Tech. I just want to see all my listening here. This company helps people find their voice and their conscience. They do good by doing well, helping get voice lessons and music education to low-income students. I thought about doing this introduction as Opera Man, but I would have to charge you extra for the concert ticket. Hailing from the music and performing arts track, please help me welcome Brooke from Sing It Forward. This is his best year so far. And in the fifth spot, this company adds a smart sensor to your green thumb. Their crop sensing technology is the brainy assistant to the smart gardener. It makes your tomatoes, your squash, and whatever product, other products you might legally be growing in Colorado better. They are Vincent, George, Eli, and Nick, Gronetics. Yeah. Listen to the judges. When the timing button turns red, you get out of the clinch and make a break. No shots below the belt. Let's have a safe and clean fight. Please help me welcome this year's championship finalist for the new Venture Challenge.
All right, wow, that's got me in a sweat. <laughs> so we're gonna jump straight into the pitches now. First up is going to be Out Loud, and we actually have a special introduction. I think it's gonna come over here, actually. Um, we've got a special introduction from Zach Neese. If I can just get this thing going. Let's see, perfect. And let's see if we can get Zach. <coughs> I'm Zach Neese, VP of Education at Techstars. I also co-teach the entrepreneurial capstone class in the computer science department with Rick Hahn. I wish I could be there with you tonight. Uh, I'm with my family as my son gets inducted into the National Junior Honor Society. <laughs> I think it's amazing the work that Silicon Flatirons does at CU on campus to promote entrepreneurship. And tonight, the New Venture Challenge Championship is really a hallmark of all the work that they do. So I'm really thrilled to introduce this next team in this environment. This next team uh, is part of our entrepreneurial capstone class. And in that, we spent about the first two months forcing computer scientists not to write a line of real code. We get them out of the building talking to potential customers. And this team did a great job of that. Then they followed that up with a really strong MVP. Then they go to South by Southwest and promote their product and their company in that environment, try to create some buzz. And then when Vahit gave his first pitch in class, and when he finished, I stood back and went, wow, that was really a good pitch. And at Techstars, I get to see a lot of really good pitches. So really strong team. I think they're definitely on to something, both in their product, their business, and the overall market trend that you're serving. It's my pleasure to introduce Vahid and Brian of Outloud. Go get them, guys. in a little bit. Every day we come across multiple articles or stories that we're genuinely interested in reading but don't have the time to sit down and do so. More often than not, we end up either completely forgetting about those articles or can't even find them later on, missing out on a lot of learning opportunities. And those of us who have tried some sort of a save now, read later app already know how things pile up way faster than we can consume to a point where the apps essentially turn into save now, read never. The problem with these apps is that they're not really addressing the underlying issue here. And that is that we simply just do not have enough time to sit down and read anymore. But while there are constraints in time, we're seeing a huge rise in multitasking opportunities. So we thought, what if we could instead listen to our reading list while we're doing other things? So of course, we went ahead and built an app that does exactly that. Outloud integrates with your reading list and keeps track of all the interesting articles that you come across. And we'll put them all in a playlist for you. So when you get in your car in the morning, you just hit play. And by the time you get to work, you finish listening to all those articles that you actually wanted to read. We drive for an average of 45 minutes every day. Just imagine how much more productive we could be if we could turn those wasted minutes into great learning opportunities. Now, how do we generate these audio files? Historically, the cost of producing audio content has been too high leaving the industry available to only a few large production companies, and in turn limiting the amount and the type of audio content available for listening. Without Loud, we're empowering everyone to produce high quality audio content in an easy and intuitive way, unlocking a world of short form content to our listeners. Anyone can record anything right from the app and share it with the entire world to hear. You can share an article with your classmates or coworkers. You could read bedtime stories out loud for your kids. You can read an article because you care about it and you want the world to know about it. Meet Ben, for example, one of our first recorders. Ben writes beautiful short stories and posts them on Medium. Ben has been reading his content out loud and building an amazing and passionate audience that he can engage with more intimately. There are hundreds of thousands just like Ben on platforms just like Medium. And out loud will allow them to do what they really want to do, reach a bigger audience. Over the past several years, audio content has become mainstream and more engaging. Podcast consumption alone is projected to grow from 8 billion hours a year today to 16 billion hours by 2020. And early successes in the digital audio industry are proving that they can generate premium advertising rates. Even though most of our user growth will be ad-supported, paid users will account for a far greater proportion of our revenue. 
and our subscription model is designed to take full advantage of this, providing elite members with ad-free and unlimited listening. We are, we are already in, in touch with a bunch of uh, bloggers, and we are planning on contacting more bloggers. And once we have blogger buy-in and a sizable user base, we'll be able to form partnerships with larger production companies and platforms. And distribution rights through these platforms will be yet another revenue channel for OutLoud. I'm Vahid Mazda, co-founder and CEO of OutLoud. We are a great team of four CU students with backgrounds in UI, UX, computer science, and audio processing. And we've had the privilege of learning from some of the top minds in this industry. We started working on OutLoud only about six months ago. Over the past two months, we built a fully functioning app. And while in closed beta, we've been seeing a growth rate of 8% week over week. But I'm pleased to announce that tonight, you'll be one of the very first to actually download the app right from the App Store. And if you don't have an iPhone, don't worry. We've built an amazing web player where you can listen to any article at any time on any device. OutLoud is making content truly accessible by offering an entirely new form of content consumption. We are changing the way people share and experience <coughs> stories while providing content producers with new and engaging ways to connect with their audiences. So if you'd also like to ride your bike and listen to articles, download the app right now. And if you're intrigued, maybe do a casual recording of one of your favorite articles tonight. Thank you. Um, so how much content do you have to have, do you think, before people are going to be willing to pay? You, you do subscription either monthly, yearly. You're not doing by artic ar uh, by article, which I think is smart. How big is the library going to need, gonna be, need to be until somebody wants to sign up? Um, we have been seeing that people actually need this so much that are signing up even with our closed beta. And we think that the need is actually out there. So we're focusing on certain topics as of, as of this moment. So tech, and then we're going to move on to other topics because we think it's better to focus on actual specific communities that would actually need, uh, need this, this service. So f the content, we don't know how much exactly it needs to be, like how much content we need at the beginning. But depending on our users, we'll, we'll determine that as we go, I think. So, so that's the content side. So tell me. It's very challenging to get consumers to not only download a native app, but then also to open it and use it. What's your go-to-market strategy for downloads when, since you're in this, going to be in the stores? Here? We think the web player will help a lot with that, actually, for people to understand what the app's actually all about. Listen to some articles on the web, and then they see the value of why they would need to download the app. But our go-to-market strategy as a whole, we're, gonna foc we're focusing right now on building out the app and then starting to build out the user base since we're really early stage. And then we're going to contact bloggers that we know to actually get recorders, to get the recorder community, the supply um, side of the business, basically. And then we think by doing that, we're actually getting their audience as well. So that would be balancing your supply and demand there. And then as soon as we have a sizable user base, we'll be looking at starting to charge for ads. That would be like the market strategy down the road. And then partnerships with platforms and uh, publishers, as I mentioned in the main pitch, the whole go-to-market strategy. So I'd be remiss here being here at a law school if I didn't ask a legal question. So are there any <laughs> copyright type issues or, you know, so if, can you be reading the New York Times? Can I listen to any articles? Yeah. So right now we're going after platforms like Medium because these are independent bloggers and journalists that actually need to get their, voice, get their voice heard and actually get some traction on their work. And we think those would benefit a lot from our app. And then as soon as we have a sizable user base, we think, people will start noticing, or we go to them and offer them and, and tell them how they can actually take advantage of our app. So that user base is kind of our focus right now to build that up, because we're a social app. So we're working on that. And then if anything ends up on the platform that is not supposed to be there, like the New York Times, we'll have flagging mechanisms like, like that of YouTube to take it down immediately if someone's not happy with the content being on the platform. I mean, could you talk the New York Times into having somebody read all that and charge, uh, you know, subscription fee for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, That's absolutely. something I'm paying for to read. I can't get to all the articles I'm driving. Would love to hear some of those additional articles. Happy to pay for it. We think New York Times would think exactly the same. So we're, we're hoping to build that user base so that we have something to show them that actually they will be able to reach a bigger audience using our app. And 
with the trends that you see with like these big players going to these aggregation and distribution uh, companies like the Apple News, Facebook Instant Articles, Snapchat Discovery and all that, you see that these big players are starting to realize that this is an important thing and they need to keep up with the technology. So we think this would be a great platform for them as well. Have you thought about bribing students with pizza and beer just to read a whole <laughs> bunch of articles and create a massive library pretty quickly? Definitely. We're going to use this money to definitely do that. Maybe not pizza, beer, <laughs> then do the articles. <laughs> pizza, articles, then beer. That's, that's the <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> right, right. There was a party right after this. Just making party. sure. All right. How do you plan to share the revenue? How do you pay for the recorders? Is it per minute, per, per article? And how much of the revenue that you guys hope to collect would go to them? How much would go to the bloggers that, that write the articles and provide the content? The, the recorders won't be making a lot of money unless there is ads that will actually give some of the money to them. Um, but if they're actually big publishing companies and they want to do their own recordings, we will follow the same model as um, the, uh, as like the, any sort of content aggregation right now. So like Apple News is doing 100% on the ads that are on their web platform. They will, they will have their 100% and 70% if they use the ad platform that Facebook or Apple News is offering them. So it will be the same sort of a model because we're thinking of adding features where people can actually, where publishers can actually record their own ads easily right from the app. And we think that would be a great thing that they can take advantage from. What's the thing you're most worried about? What's keeping you up at night right now? Um, this was keeping me up at night. <laughs> uh, but the legality and how that's going to work out is probably one of our biggest risks at this, at this, at this point now. Yeah. Cool. All right, thank you Out Loud team. Up next is the Space Research Company and to help introduce them is Diane DeMeff. Thank you. <laughs> That's nice. I'm so glad I didn't have to follow Brad. <laughs> I'm uh, very honored to introduce Christine Fan Chang and Luis Z Oh. I didn't know it was over there. Okay, so I'm very honored to introduce Christine Fan Chang and Luis Seya, who are um, of the Space Research Company. Chris, this, uh, Christine came up with the idea for space research as a part of the 2014 Silicon Valley Space Startup Weekend, which she won. Um, from there, she and Louise started to build the company, and this was during the time that they were completing their PhD th uh, dissertations in aerospace, so they were very busy. I've worked with them a bit, and I have found them incredibly uh, driven to learn about entrepreneurship and to build their business. Um, not only are Christine and Luis um, aspiring and promising entrepreneurs, but they're also inspiring entrepreneurs because of their uh, significant outreach efforts in the STEM area, encouraging the next generation of aerospace entrepreneurs. Luis and Christine. Form development. So, 
We're, my name is Christine Banchang. This is Dr. Louis Saya. We're the space research company. We're excited to tell you how we're accelerating the process for doing research in space. But why is it slow now? The problem is we only have one research platform to do this right now. It's the International Space Station. It takes nearly two years for a researcher to get one experiment into space. It's expensive and they also have to wait for the experience to come back to Earth before they can do the analysis. Uh, and unless you happen to be from one of the five member space agencies, you're not allowed to use it at all. In fact, there are 46 space agencies now that have no access at all. But we're here to change that. Introducing the BioCube. This is a four inch box that contains all the hardware needed to do one experiment in space. It uses a cartridge, a disposable plastic cartridge about the size of your credit card that can be 3D printed for less than $2,000. All the scientists have to do is send their samples to us. We do everything else from packaging it up, getting the paperwork done by NASA, and then launching, operating it with our partners. And then we collect the data and send it right back to the researcher. This process is fast and easy for the scientists. They no longer have to worry about building their own hardware or doing all the paperwork. Instead, they focus on their science. With our package, we can now uh, make experiment times run up to six months. This results in large cost savings. And as a commercial enterprise, um, we can now open up space for researchers across the world. We give them three options. They could do one analysis run for $10,000, or they could do a full experiment for $100,000. We also have a customizable platform for about $350,000. Even NASA has four solicitations out now asking for this type of hardware to increase the number of experiments done here on Earth, or on space. Um, there, while there are 7.2 million researchers now, only about 1,000 of them have been able to participate in space. With our lower costs and our faster turnaround time, we're now lowering barriers so we can expand this market to 1% of this unserved market. Imagine, it's like with the cost of our, our hardware now, we're looking at a $25 billion opportunity. So even the 60 projects that we have now have made breakthroughs in osteoporosis, diabetes, and cancer. Imagine what 6,000 projects could do. We have a step-by-step -step plan to achieve this. Even a small 10K investment will help us to build our 3D cartridges early on, allowing us to secure funding for government and uh, early customers. In two years, we plan to have our hardware on the space station and fully tested. We plan to execute this with a very experienced team. Luis and I have led and managed a number of uh, engineering groups here at CU. We've helped garnered over $350,000 in grants and scholarships and fellowships. And Dr. Michael Franklin has been building small microfluidic devices for nearly a decade. Our team is supported by uh, great ex expert advisors from NASA, Airbus, um, and BioServe. But just imagine, imagine what the future might look like with thousands of researchers working together to find a cure for cancer. And this is just the beginning. Entrepreneurship is about being bold and putting up, finding the very boundaries of our possibility. Help us as we ignite the next biggest wave of human discovery and innovation. We're the space research company here to serve 7 billion people from space. I'd like well, to take some uh, questions from the judges now. Well, congratulations on making it to the finals. Thank uh, you. We have to stop meeting like this. I think this is the <laughs> third time uh, that uh, Christine and I have uh, been party to with me as a judge and, and you presenting. And so uh, it looks like you guys have definitely made some progress since uh, last year. And so tell me about that. It sounds like. I know you've got the prototype box you're talking about. Is that right? You're already using that, but it sounds like you're still building the 3D cartridges. Is that kind of the next? Yeah, actually. Um, iteration. 
So I want to show you, so this is, again, the cartridge itself is what we call like a bread and butter. So this is a 3D printed prototype, but what we're looking for are these, you can see how um, finely etched some of these particular, uh, I would say, veins are for the, the microfluidics. So this is the more, most difficult part, I would say, for our prototype, is to understand it's like how can we actually run kind of the biology experiments um, in these microfluidics cards. So you said you did 10 um, trips? Are you so that w yeah, 10 launches, 10 launches. Um, before. And that was actually when we were working for BioServe Space Technologies, which is a, a center here at, at CU, um, helping other experimenters put their experiments into the space station. So how many are you projecting for 2016 then? 2016, for our first, because we're, we're testing out, we have kind of the three different product areas, we're thinking most likely five of the sample analysis, but then possibly one of the, the full cube um, analysis. So that's six. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so translate that into revenues for me. So that's, uh, we're looking around, that would be like, 150 to 200,000 um, the first year. Great. How do you, what background in manufacturing do you folks have? Obviously, this is zero fault manufacturing. If you launch something up in space and it doesn't work, that's a big bummer. Yeah, so <laughs> exactly. So there, there are two parts to that, I guess, question. One is um, our, our third uh, person who's not here is a microfluidics expert. So he's been working on this for, as I mentioned, like nearly a decade. So he knows how to build a lot of this, and actually they've built some for spaceflight before. Um, and then the second aspect is, because we have a really strong mentoring team um, and advisors from NASA, what we'll do is have essentially called like milestone meetings before we launch that they can go and review all our hardware. And for them, that's essentially the, the usual way we do a lot of the aerospace hardware development is to check, uh, do a checkout and engineering um, run through presentation uh, with some of these experts. And what sort of intellectual property protection do you have on the hardware that you're building? Right now, so we're looking to um, essentially get a patent on it, but at the same time, because we're still going undergoing the design of what should go in it in terms of membranes and sensors, where we haven't um, closed that gap yet, but definitely something worth considering. I'm wondering, and maybe a, a build on Jason's question, what did you learn from the 10 that have already, you've gone sent 10, right? Yeah. What did you learn, what, and what did you change? Um, I, so I want to clarify because the 10 was for, I would say it's for, um, it was for a different company that I had worked for that we were, you know, it's like doing this for the researchers. So it wasn't necessarily tied to what we've done. Got it. But at the same time, a lot of what we learned is literally how to streamline the process of getting the hardware approved. So once you've built a hardware, how do you approve it through NASA? So that the whole point is we have that kind of expertise. And so the researchers or the scientists that we approach, they don't need to learn all that extra information. Um, so we, yeah. And if I could add to that. Um, in a nutshell, we've learned two things, I'd say. One is the fact that there's so many benef benefits that can come out from space research, and a lot of people don't know that. Pharmaceutical companies are starting to know this, not, not uh, completely broad yet. And the second is how hard it is for scientists right now. There's very little access to space, and we want to change that. And have you already secured NASA's cooperation? And what would happen if, if NASA said, no, I don't want to work with you, or um, we don't want to take these cubes into space. Are there other alternatives? I, I would imagine that there are these days. Actually, so we are also looking at other, so while NASA is a very, uh, I guess, important kind of, um, I would say, milestone to get their feedback or get their, their buy-in, um, we do have a lot of strong mentors actually from NASA who are very supportive in trying to get us in the pipeline to essentially help accelerate some of these programs. So we have a very strong network from there, but we're also looking and talking to other companies that are building what we call, again, the, the new space, commercial space labs. So things like SpaceX, um, there's a Bigelow Aerospace, as well as Dream Chaser just down the road out here. So they're, they're actually um, building all these new vehicles and they're looking for potential scientists to, to work on that. But the thing is they don't have the hardware um, to actually run the science experience. So that's where we come in to partner with them to say, oh, we can build a lot of the hardware that can go help, the, help them attract more of the scientists to use their vehicles. Great, thank you. Thank you. If you're standing in the back, there's plenty of seats down here. So come on down, plenty of seats thank if you're you. standing in the back. It would be a good time to come down. Andy gets people to yeah. Down. So, 
please do come on down. We actually have one award presentation before we break you loose for our next break. But come sit, come sit. Please make yourselves at home. So up next, before we do break, we've got Brad Bernthal to present the Entrepreneurial Alumnus of the Year Award. So let's have Brad Bernthal back down. I see him in the room. Brad Bernthal back down. <laughs> It's a song. I love he as a song. Okay. For those of you who know my love for the Boston's, I'd let that go for a long time. Uh, this is uh, maybe not going to be quite as energetic, but it is uh, just so important. Um, our Alumnus of the Year Award uh, goes to Jason Eckenroth and Jeff Carroll. Jason, Jeff, you guys want to come up? Wait for a moment. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Jason uh, is a double CU graduate. He did his undergrad in civil engineering and computer science, and then he did his master's degree in structural engineering. Uh, he knew he was going to be a software entrepreneur, and he founded 688 Solutions in 2000. He bootstrapped this company all the way, and uh, a playbook that Ship Compliant instructs is if you can find a way to fund your company and give yourself runway until you find that thing, this was what Jason did. He did software projects, gave himself that runway to find the right product, and he saw an opportunity. The wine industry was growing, and it was doing more and more direct shipments to consumers. They saw a pain point for wine industry uh, participants. First. Those in individuals and companies needed up-to-date state regulation and tax rules, and at the same time, two, they needed to track their shipments so they could ensure compliance with regulations. Lawyers. 2005, <laughs> enter Jeff Carroll, background as a software engineer, importantly, a tennis player with a terrific return of serve. <laughs> Jeff did his MBA at Leeds here at CU Boulder, and Jason brought Jeff on in 2005. Jason, Jeff, and their team at Ship Compliant hit the gas around 2005, and they found their solution for the wine industry. This did not happen overnight. They grew the company for 10 years. They have a values-based organization. Feel it, authentic empathy for customers, partners, and each other. Own it, take responsibility for outcomes, good and bad. Shape it, have a passion for the possibilities, and scale it. They're born from bootstrap roots, and they leverage opportunities for exponential impact. This company, Ship Compliant, made a difference in this economy. They employed 47 people, made the 2014 Inc. 5000 list of the fastest growing privately held companies in the nation. They had revenues of over $8 million in 2014. And last year in 2015, they merged with Sovos Compliance, a tough decision for Jason and Jeff but one that was a very happy event for them and their company's owners. Please help me welcome back to see you and congratulate this year's Entrepreneurial Alumnus Award winners, Jason and Jeff. All right, everybody, that wraps the first half of the evening, so we will head into a short break. We'll be back here at 6.40. Um, you'll hear the siren when we want you back in, but we've got some refreshments next door, and we've got the demo desks outside.